welcome to the Zionist Federation special broadcast. We have tonight two phenomenally special guests and truly grateful for them joining us today for the special occasion. We have Haver Knesset, Minister of Knesset, Yuli Edelstein, and we have ITV broadcaster, Ragi Omar. Let me tell you just a little bit about each. Uh, Ragi Omar is a Somali-born journalist and writer. Um, uh, Ragi was working for the BBC uh, as a world affairs correspondent where he made quite a name for himself reporting from Iraq. And Omar joined um, ITV News in 2013 and ever since, um, and since October 2015, alongside his duties as international affairs editor, was, is also deputy newscaster of ITV News at 10. So welcome Ragi and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Paul. Um, Yuli, for those of you who don't, uh, Yuli Khaverkines and Yuli Edelstein, was born in the Soviet Union and was one of the most prominent refuseniks. After moving to Israel and serving in the IDF, Yuli decided to serve in politics. Uh, Yuli was elected to the Knesset in 1996 and has served as Minister of Immigration and Absorption and Minister of Information in the Diaspora during that time. Following the 2013 elections, Yuli became the Speaker of the Knesset. He recently stepped down in 2020, after which he has become the famous Minister of Health in probably the most followed health ministry in the world today. So I welcome you both and thank you both from the bottom of our Zedith hearts. Thank you for joining us and good to see you. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. Minister Edelstein, it's very good to have you. Um, I can only imagine how busy you must be, as uh, Paul was saying, in probably the most followed uh, uh, ministry of health uh, in the world. Um, let's just get straight to this whole issue, which has gripped the entire uh, globe, which is the coronavirus. Um, Israel, right from the outset, was determined to, as the startup nation, as it sort of um, styles itself, to tackle this with all of its know-how all of its scientific knowledge um, uh, head on as much as it could. It did so very, very well initially. I think most people would ad 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 admit that um, and say that Israel really did uh, steal a march on a lot of other countries, but there have also been setbacks. So from the outset and in your position as Minister of Health, what do you feel have been the successes? What do you think have been the failures that could have been tackled better? Well, First of all, thank you for inviting me to talk to you. Uh, I have to say that uh, we may be a startup nation and we have a very good record both in medical field and in developing all kinds of uh, biological and relevant industries under the circumstances. Having said that, we had hard times during the coronavirus. We had three difficult lockdowns. We are facing all the same problems that are very well known in all democratic countries of people, you know, uh, generally not uh, being so eager to comply with all kinds of restrictions. And in Israel, you know, in this topsy-turvy world, it's sometimes even more difficult because of our experience. We've been through difficult times, wars and terror attacks. So we are kind of used to difficulties, but we are used also to a certain pattern. There was a difficult war. In the end, we prevailed. Now let's go back to normal. Let's take care of, of the casualties of their families, of the wounded. Let's uh, uh, rebuild the economy. Here, people are expecting from the government time after time, after a difficult lockdown, okay, now tell us, have we won? Where's the picture of, of our victory? And there is no picture of our victory time after time. The virus is a very difficult enemy till we finally got to the issue of vaccination. And here, I'm still very cautious. I'm not talking about victory. The virus is still here. It's probably hiding in some corner. It's just waiting for us to make a mistake and to attack. But I think the situation is different. What's the decision-making process? As you said, I mean, Israel tackles things in a way that many other countries don't. There are certain structures in which, you know, national threats go through, which other countries don't have. So, okay, you're the Minister of Health, but you're not in operating in a vacuum alongside the Prime Minister. So just describe to us what's the decision-making process and where are the decisions made? 
to be quite frank, to say, uh, to say it was brutal honesty, it's very difficult because on one hand, there are, uh, which is quite legit, ministers with different fields of responsibility that are very eager to protect their sphere. Minister of Transportation says, I absolutely understand, but let the flights go on, let the buses work as usual, don't stop the trains and so on and so forth. Minister of Economy or of Finance obviously say, yeah, we understand the need for the lockdown, but just keep the economy open. Otherwise we wouldn't even have money for your ministry. The same goes to Minister of Education, protecting the school system and so on and so forth. So each time it's a very, long and tiresome dialogue with every ministry that Minister of Health has to, ha has to deal with. I do have to say that I enjoy the pretty good support of the Prime Minister on, the, on most our demands as Health Ministry, but each time it was a very long process and we, well, I won't go into all the political details, but we have a complicated government this time, a very complicated coalition. So it each time took a while, which, and you said in your first initial question, uh, what could you do better? What could be done differently? Uh, I would say that sometimes, unfortunately, the decisions, though recommended on, on time, were not taken on time. That's why sometimes it prolonged the lockdowns in an unnecessary way and so on and so forth, just because of the long political process. Could I take you back to the beginning? I mean, at first, there were some things that were really very uh, important. And I sort of, you know, followed this. I mean, obviously it hit the UK very, very hard, you know, uh, compared to other European uh, countries. But one of the things was the, the race for ventilators. And there was a huge sort of scramble around the world and Israel's, you know, fabled sort of security services were being written about trying to source, you know, ventilators. Take us through that. And how did that move on from the initial thing of ventilators to the lockdown? And then I also want to get back to getting Israeli citizens back from all over the world. But tell me about the race for ventilators at the very beginning. Well, in the very beginning, obviously, uh, there was uh, a lot of uncertainty. Things were totally unknown. So uh, we started looking in all the necessary medical equipment. And at that stage, the, the immediate reaction to every severe case of coronavirus was to put a patient, a person on a ventilator. It turned out very quickly that we don't have enough in Israel. So exactly as you described in every possible way, we started collecting ventilators and other necessary equipments, uh, equipment. Sometimes right now we even have uh, stocks of equipment we are trying to donate or sell to other countries. But uh, I'm not saying that in any ironic way, I think that was a necessary reaction at the initial stage. Ironically enough, uh, very soon, the Israeli medical teams that are really incredible, I'm objective and I'm not a medical doctor, I can tell you they are really, really incredible. They very soon learned that it's not the necessary protocol, not necessary procedure to put every patient on a ventilator. There are other ways to deal with that, the high flow and other, and other possibilities. So at some stage, it even kind of backfired because I would come to the government and say, the situation is very difficult. We have a lot of people hospitalized. And they would say, some of the ministers would say in response, but you have very few people on ventilators. It, mean that it means that the disease is not really spreading. So that, that was something that we also had to deal with. From that, we realized that just having proper medical equipment and the corona departments now hospitals is not enough. We don't want to lose control over the numbers of newly infected. And here came the issue of the lockdown. Israel actually was one of the first countries to close its airport. Uh, that was not greeted with admiration by many countries those days. I'm talking about, say, March, uh, when some countries even raised their brows and said, wait a second, you are a friendly country. Why are you doing that to us? But very soon the world realized that it's it's not about free travel when, when you are dealing with in a pandemic of that kind. Um, we've had a few questions already um, from, from uh, people, um, and a lot of it revolves around the green passport. I mean, of course, 
you know, Israel is an independent country, but of course there are many, many sort of um, uh, people from the Jewish communities all over the world who are either dual citizens or have relatives and so forth in the diaspora. So one question says, and my wife and I want to come to Israel uh, between June and August. We're having our second AstraZeneca jabs on the 22nd of April. When will we be able to get our green cards and should that be prerequisite to, to our coming? I mean, a lot of people asking about this whole issue of the green passports. Well, first of all, uh, to those who are less familiar with, with this term, we are using uh, green, we, in, inside the country, we call it green passes in order for people who are fully vaccinated to use certain facilities, uh, fully vaccinated or those who recovered from the disease, uh, fitness centers for that matter, or some other facilities that unfortunately we still can't open to everyone, though the numbers of vaccinated are incredible still. There is over a, mil a million people in Israel eligible uh, for the vaccine and they are not unfortunately vaccinated yet. But uh, uh, Alongside with that, we are seriously considering the idea of green passports, meaning having, I think in most cases, it would be bilateral uh, agreements with different countries uh, that will say that if this or that country, same as Israel, used recognized vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, all those vaccines that get the approval of a European, uh, European medical agency or the British regulator or the FDA, uh, uh, they can have the tourist exchange without a quarantine, uh, probably subject to negative corona tests, but without uh, putting people into quarantine for a 10 day period the way it is. But that's uh, right going to take some time to work out, isn't it? I mean, if you consider people like the person just asking the question who want to come and visit, you know, their relatives, you're going to have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who are going to want to come. You know, if you haven't married up this system, you know, with the UK or with Austria or with Nigeria or wherever, how's it going to work? No, that's exactly the story. That's exactly the story. I think that we'll first and foremost uh, try to find ways to have bilateral agreements so that Israelis will be able to travel to the UK and people from the UK, tourists from the UK to come to Israel, win-win uh, situation. I'm absolutely aware of the fact uh, that you mentioned that uh, uh, we can't uh, pretend that we are in Ireland. We have diaspora, we have Jewish communities all around the world. We'll have to deal with that. We definitely have what we call Aliyah, still immigration to Israel that hasn't been stopped. We have new immigrants coming these days. Uh, but uh, I uh, have to say that at this stage, uh, we are in the very early stage of checking this issue and negotiations. I sincerely hope, uh, speaking of our viewer or listener, that uh, by June, July, August, we'll be definitely in a different situation as far as the issue of the green passport is concerned. I'd like to get on, Minister Edelstein, to the whole issue of coronavirus and the Haredim community. I mean, it's been written about extensively. Um, now, everyone viewing this will know that the Haredi community have been hit extremely hard because of their practices, because of their continued sort of religious observance. And many other Israelis have been very critical of the government in saying that they should have been much stronger in acting against it uh, uh, and, and enforcing um, uh, protocols on the Haredi community. First of all, I mean, do you accept those criticisms that, that this community was treated with a different set of um, principles than other Israelis who, who may have been flouting the, 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 the social distancing? Well, we starting, uh, Raju was uh, talking about democracies and how they deal with this whole thing of lockdowns and the restrictions, uh, never easy. Uh, neither vis-a-vis -vis the ultra-Orthodox community, nor the Arab community, nor the secular youngsters in Tel Aviv that just want to celebrate. So. Uh, uh, it's not easy. The police is used uh, to catching criminals. In this case, they see people who are, can I say, quote, unquote, or I even wouldn't say, quote, unquote, normative people. They just don't behave according to the regulations of the health ministry. And, and uh, this is the kind of attitude that I was trying to fight. I said, listen, you know, with this kind of attitude, we can't enforce anything. We have to understand that people who are not behaving under the rules are spreading the disease. Now, let's go back to the ultra Orthodox community, the Haredi community. Yes, there were violations there, numerous violations, mostly 
in the field of education. In the, the initial stage, there were some spiritual leaders, some rabbis who said, you know, we'll take our risks. We won't let our youngsters leave schools. They have to stay uh, in schools and study Torah. Yes, we know that it's dangerous, but we'll take the risk. Thank God, with a lot of efforts on our side and not just enforcement, the situation changed. And I do have to say that the most prominent rabbis in the ultra orthodox community uh, issued very strong statements. First of all, about the necessity to uh, have corona tests. And then when vaccination came, I personally spoke to some most prominent leaders there and they issued strong statements on the necessity, some of them even uh, phrased it as kind of a halachi ruling to go and get the vaccine and not to endanger other people or yourself. So uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this aspect, we're, we're doing not bad. Having said that, we have to understand one thing. We have a lot of uh, outbursts of the disease uh, within the Haredi community and in the Arab sector. Uh, I don't think it's because the virus doesn't like ultra orthodox Jews or, or Arabs. It's just because of the socioeconomic situation in parts of this community. When you have, uh, you know, I always like these comparisons between Israel and other countries, but when you have families of one or families of two in an apartment, it's one thing. When you have a family of 12 as a kind of normal in one apartment that is not necessarily very big, so it's enough that one kid comes with the disease back home, then you have 12 cases. Is there vaccine uh, skepticism in uh, is parts of Israeli uh, society that is refusing to take up the vaccine? I mean, you're, you're racing through the uh, vaccinations in, in Israel as, as Britain has begun to do now, but as there are communities here that have doubts about taking the vaccine, is that the case in Israel? And what are you doing about it if there is? Yes. We have, like every other place in the world, we have a small, shall I say, sect of people who are ideological anti-vaxxers. That's their life, they, their ideology. They live for that. They, they, they are prepared, uh, I don't want to say to die for that, but it's a dangerous sect. I don't have any doubts about it. There are unfortunately people who fall victims to fake news spread by these guys or by someone else. And, you know, I'll give you the strongest example of all that young people shouldn't, uh, young, young women shouldn't take the vaccine because then they will never become pregnant, they will never give birth and so on and so forth. It's something we've been fighting from the very beginning. All the prominent doctors in the relevant fields issued letters about it, statements about it, rulings about it. We still have it. Having said that, you know, we passed 5 million uh, people vaccinated, at least with the first jab, uh, out of the potential of probably this stage, 6.2, 6.3 million. So with all the due respect to all those who are trying to spread the fake news or fight the vaccine, they are not very successful. Most people behave responsibly. And I do have to say, I mentioned spiritual leaders, but I do have to say that professionals, doctors, nurses have been very helpful, especially let's say in the Arab community, in the community of Ethiopian immigrants that were very skeptical in the beginning. We brought doctors and nurses who spoke to them in their native tongue and very quickly persuaded many of them to go and get the vaccine. Okay, we haven't got much time left, so I want to get through <clears throat> and widen the uh, uh, remit. I mean, by the time this program goes out, it will be only, what, a day or two until uh, the Israeli uh, election, the fourth in, what, two years? I mean, first of all, is it the right time to be holding it in the middle of a sort of pandemic? I mean, it's March. I mean, first of all, there's that issue with Passover at the same time. Um, and secondly, when's it ever going to end? Well, the first answer, uh, I'm telling you that as health minister, is no, no, and no. It's the worst time you can imagine. And I had been warning about it before the new elections were announced many times. It's difficult to run the pandemic under any circumstances. Through the election campaign, it makes it nearly impossible. I can tell you that I, uh, uh, you know, if you would ask me what I'm most proud of, 
is that we managed to go out of the last lockdown during the election campaign exactly according to the recommendations of the health ministry. This is an achievement I will, I guess, never forget in my life because I, I, because I was so afraid of this wave of populism and, you know, the disease is not here, just let's open everything and so on and so forth. But thank God in the, mean, in the meanwhile, we are holding still, we have a lot of questions and you just mentioned the uh, matter of factly, the issue of Israelis who are currently abroad and want to come back home. We opened the airport to approximately 3,000 Israeli citizens a day just because of the issue of the elections. That was never the recommendation of the health ministry. We understand the danger with all these variants uh, that could uh, appear here in Israel when people come from all around the world. But uh, we have been told, and rightly so, that we can't hold Israeli citizens abroad when the election is coming. So there is obviously the influence of the elections on the situation of our combating the pandemic. I just sincerely hope that it won't hurt in any way the vaccination campaign. Um, very quickly, um, there have been some comments in the international media um, uh, criticizing Israel for not doing more with regard to vaccinations to help the Palestinian authorities. There's strong criticisms from, you know, British newspapers and, and other and elsewhere, saying that Israel was uh, in, engaged in what's being called a vaccine nationalism. What's your response? Do you, have, do, you, do you have a clean conscience that Israel has done whatever it can to help the Palestinian Authority, even though it's not your, maybe your legal obligation to? Well, as far as my conscience is concerned, I do have to say that on this issue, it's absolutely clean. I think that from the very beginning of the pandemic, we were cooperating with the Palestinians. Sometimes it was even strange because uh, what could be simpler than picking up the phone and calling, say, the Minister of Health and saying, Mr. Minister, hi, I'm your Palestinian counterpart. Could you please help us with this and that? Never happened. I got phone calls and mails and, uh, and WhatsApps from dozens of uh, ministers from all around the world. Some of them I know personally, some of them I've never heard of, but not from the Palestinian Authority. Having said that, we uh, supplied the uh, drugs, uh, different types of medicine, equipment, all kinds of things needed for their medical teams. At the very early stage, when we just started our vaccination campaign, we supplied a number of doses uh, to the Palestinian medical teams dealing with the coronavirus patients. And uh, just recently, and I do have to say it was a moving experience, we started vaccinating Palestinian workers working in Israel. Uh, the reaction was very positive. I was at some stage afraid that their minds could be poisoned by some so-called leaders in the Palestinian Authority that would tell them that Israelis are trying to poison them or something like that. But there was great response. I personally witnessed it. We're talking about 130,000 of Palestinians who work in Israel side by side with Israelis, some of them for many years, and it's their absolute right to get the vaccine. That's what we are doing. Last question. Um, it seems almost certain, and President Biden has said um, during the campaign that he would return America to the negotiating table when it comes to the Iran nuclear deal. That was his platform on which he campaigned. It seems almost certain that that will happen again. Um, is that a reality that your government accepts? And if so, what does it want to see? Because going back to the JCPOA, as it's called, uh, as in 2005, 2015, doesn't seem a reality. The world has changed. Other files want to be included. Iran says, no, it was America that walked away. There has to be consequences on the American side. So first of all, it's going to happen, isn't it? Some shape or form. What is Israel's position? Well, first of all, I think that uh, had, had Israel been more let's say, involved and consulted on the first agreement, uh, as you mentioned in uh, 2015, I think it would be quite uh, probable to, to believe that there would be less holes in the agreement than, than the one that finally uh, was uh, signed. Uh, I will just give you one example. The very fact that uh, uh, we, we, the world, want Iranians to slow down their path to nuclear weapons doesn't mean that in the meanwhile they can get what in James Bond movies they used to call license to kill. And that's exactly what happened with this agreement. Iranians kind of got 
license to kill, meaning support Hezbollah, support Hamas, uh, get involved in Syria, attack Israel, do whatever they want because they are just trying to live according to the obligations of the JCPO agreement. So if there will be some re renegotiations of the agreement, uh, we would A, want uh, Israel to be much more involved with what is really being signed. And second, this issue of conventional weapons or conventional weapons, this issue of terror support, all these things, their involvement in countries like Syria and other places should be taken into, taken into consideration. We can't pretend that you can like put a, a fence between the issue of, of the nukes and the issue of their military power and their destabilization of the whole region here. Do you think there's going to be another election in Israel within a few months or six months from now again? Uh, I uh, hope and pray it's not going to happen. I hope and pray that we, we I'm not objective, we really could, uh, Netanyahu will be able to form a stable government. Uh, to tell you quite frankly, uh, this is what our country really needs. Stability, to calm down, to deal with the consequences of the pandemic, to start rebuilding the economy that is doing not that bad, but still we have a long way to go to prove that we are back on track. Well, um, we'll see in a few days if uh, Israelis agree with you uh, or not. Um, Minister Yuli Edelstein, thank you very much indeed for talking to us or talking to me. My absolute pleasure. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for your time. I said one, question, but that always means an extra one with us journalists. You know that. <laughs> okay. We have muted everyone's audio. All of these important activists who have gathered on this lobby day to press for a cause. Hi, and welcome to the ZF Annual Fundraiser. Hello, I'm Tipi Khotavelli, the Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom, and I want to send my deepest gratitude and congratulations to the Zionist Federation here in the UK for another year of excellent advocacy and campaign work on behalf of our beloved State of Israel. I am so proud to be associated with the work of the Zionist Federation, doing important work in a very difficult climate. So please support them as much as you can. To do their work, they need your support as much today as they ever have. Please get behind the Zion so they can continue to get behind Zion. Please, on the March the 21st, dip into your pockets and give generously. It has never been more important to tell the truth. Please do everything possible to support ZF. Thank you, ZF. You represent the best of who we can be as a community. I wish all at the Zionist Federation every success and thank you for what you do to support the State of Israel. The events were fantastic and they have encompassed the great story of the Jewish community and the Zionist movement in the United Kingdom and Ireland. Thank you very much. The Zionist Federation works tirelessly to promote and stand up for Zionism throughout the country. Please donate and support us. Help us continue to do the job we love to do. We need your help. We cannot do it alone. Thank you.